living in a really poor neighborhood, and I didn't see any opportunity after my high school. And uh, I was just kind of looking around to get out of the country. I didn't know where to go. And uh, uh, after some decisions, I decided to come to the United States. I came here January of 1971. The immigration was a little easy at that time. So a lot of people were applying for it. They were getting visas. After a year, year and a half, I met one Pakistani walking on the street. And uh, he asked me, he said, Salaam Alaikum, and I said, Salaam Alaikum. That's how, you know, we met. But at that time, there was no one there. Muslims from South Asia started coming to this country around year 1900. And they were searching for economic opportunities in America. But they were small groups, individuals. Back in 1960, there were a greater number of them arriving here, but now for, uh, for the purpose of education, not just work, seeking education in America. When I came there, I didn't know anybody, any Shia family. When the Muharram came uh, in that same year, 1971, uh, we didn't know any family. We didn't know where to go to. We were wondering, uh, yeah, this is Muharram is coming and we don't know where there's going to be majas or there's going to be any activity. So he wrote it on a piece of paper, a little piece of paper. He wrote it, uh, Majlis e Aza is going to be happening this Saturday, coming Saturday at our home. And, and uh, you are invited. All that little slip of paper. And uh, in the hallway, uh, he just taped it with a little tape, put it on the little hallway, and I kind of laughed at him. To our surprise, and we came home and, and the people start calling and we couldn't believe that where is this why this call is coming and how they're finding out there's a majlis. One guy called and he said, I'm a, I do the Sos Khani and I can read Mercia and other. I said, great, yeah, come on over. And then, um, then another guy called and he said, I'm a Zakir, I read majlis. And uh, I heard you're having a majlis. Can I read majlis? Because there's nobody available. So of course. <laughs> At that time, you know, the, there was no azadari or anything like that here. When Ashura came, uh, a day, two days before Ashura, I started calling the people I knew. You know, there's 15, 20 families were there, you know, Indian, Pakistani combined. So I called them and I said, you know, I'm having an. Uh, afternoon Ashura Majlis, so you, know, you are invited to come here. We didn't have any alim at that time to recite, so we used to play, you know, Rashid Turabi's, you know, tapes and other Molana's tapes, you know, and uh, do Matam. South Asian people have this sensitivity that, you know, especially when Muharram comes, what do we do? And this is amazing that, you know, it's Hussein ibn Ali, it's his name and his, his, his memory which brings the community together. And the whole formation of a community, as far as she has a concern, in migration, uh, starts with the name of Hussein. Of course, see, the day of Ashura is a day that a mu'min cannot forget it. No matter what, he tries to uh, remember that day and commemorate that day. It started gradually First from holding the majalis of Imam Hussain alayhi salatu wasalam on Ashura and in Muharram at uh, private residences. Um, few people in New York, in New Jersey, in Chicago, in certain other places, they would gather at somebody's apartment and uh, mainly on the day of Ashura or a day or two before or after and have had the tape recorder and a cassette to listen a majlis. Although they were missing their back home, they were missing their culture, their tradition, and their families, uh, but something they were missing the most, that was this aza, and azadari and majalis as uh, Shia Isna Asharis. It was part of their blood, it was part of their faith to uh, have the Aza and Azadari of Imam alayhi salatu wasalam in Muharram and Safar. So that was the time when uh, they would start searching and looking around that is there any Shia, is there any center, is there something. Their identity was 
the, this love of Muhammad wa Ahli Bayti Muhammad and uh, they felt that they can only hold themselves on the path if they stick with this love of Ahlul Bayt and the remembrance of Ahlul Bayt. Then I thought, you know, maybe I should, you know, start an organization here, yes, Shia, because there was none in the United States at that time. So I organized, an, uh, you know, Husseini Association of Greater Chicago in the uh, end of 71. We contacted Aga Khoui to help us buy a center in Chicago. So Aga Khoui was very gracious since this was the first organization in the United States. Uh, he sent uh, whatever was the price of that building, he sent more than that amount through uh, Iran. The decade of 2000, where this Sahaba movement in Pakistan started, killing Shias, targeting Shias, especially all those who were professionals, you know, ulama, social workers, and even those who were in government official, uh, you know, good positions, they would be killed, the lawyers, doctors, in very large number. That basically became a reason for many of these Shias from Pakistan to move. And one of the countries that they chose was Canada. Because of the reputation that Canada has as a generous country, you know, and the facilities that the government provides for refugees and the citizens in general. And so you will see from um, late 90s onwards, there was an influx of especially the Pakistani Shias in large number. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in uh, actually more than one verse. He talks about the concept of Iman, Jihad, and Hijrah all together. Alladheena amanu wa hajaru wa jahadu or for example, Alladheena amanu wa jahadu wa hajaru. So the concept of Hijrah is part of our faith anyway. Interestingly, if you look at the Islamic calendar, it doesn't begin with the birth of the Prophet or the demise of the Prophet. It begins with the hijrah of the Prophet from Makkah to Medina. It has been a very interesting journey for me because uh, when I moved with my wife in 18, 1983, you know, all my children are grown up, born here, raised here, married here. <laughs> so for us, this is the Watan now. You know, there's no issue of saying that, you know, oh, we are here for a few years and then we'll go back. The first Koja immigrants arrived here in about the mid to late 1960s. Some came as students to pursue further studies, others came as economic migrants. Gradually, over the course of the next few years, they were joined by a bigger group from Uganda, people who were expelled by the military government there. The situation in East Africa politically, first was the revolution in 1964, of the Zanzibar. A few families and few individuals left at that time and moved towards west. But the main part came, the major, uh, if you like, the exodus or the refugee status where Khoja community migrated to the west was the expulsion of the uh, Asians uh, from Uganda by General Idi Amin. That was in 1972, the North American uh, continent, so America and Canada, um, decided to take some of these people into their countries. Somehow luck had to come my way. When I turned 21 and I was introduced to a lady from the Canadian High Commissioner's office who just casually says, you should be in Canada. I had never heard of this Canada thing. I knew from school days, but Canada. How far? Where? In 1968, April 28th, I was in Canada. In Dar es Salaam, I wasn't a staunch follower of the faith. I guess it was arrogance, ignorance. Most of us were flamboyant. Most of us wanted to escape from something. The difference between us and when the majority came was we sought our way to come out. 
whereas all the other people were asked to go out. I didn't care if I didn't pray. I didn't care if I did not eat halal meat or haram meat. I didn't care. I realized that my wife was pregnant. And now we are going to have a newborn baby. My son, incidentally, is the first one from the Koja family to be born in Canada. Responsibilities started coming my way. I had to shoulder them. And the only salvation I had was religion, which my wife brought. I found another six or seven guys that come from Tanzania. And we were 17 of us. And that thought that, you know, what would happen if one of us passed away led me to believe that we, should, we need a congregation, we need a community. Salim Sachadina took the initiative and said, let's start a community. In those early days, they would have to go to each other's uh, houses, into the basements or apartments. Uh, sometimes they would rent school halls in order to commemorate uh, events on our Islamic calendar. Um, so difficult days, uh, uh, those early days for our people. Um, but uh, alhamdulillah, we managed to uh, overcome many of those difficulties and uh, went on to acquire our own centers uh, you know, whether it was converting churches to mosques and, and, and the like. Initially, we performed our majlises at people's homes because we were 16, 17 people. We started renting bowling alleys. We started renting, I mean, getting free of charge government buildings, depending on the time of the day we were going to have our congregation. The first Ashura was done, held at at my building where I used to live, and there was a recreational hall there. And there were non-Shias, like Qureshi Saab, who brought uh, Fatihas for us, uh, helped us. Initially, without resources and numbers, um, they established small uh, Jamaat organizations, but not necessarily with properties or centers uh, immediately. But as their resources and as their affluence grew, they were able to uh, afford to buy uh, and convert properties uh, into mosques. Um, they also had the foresight to, 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 to establish uh, kabristans, um, as well as uh, house madrasas and, and other religious uh, institutions within the properties that they built. We were faced with individuals or groups of people who harassed us. We tried to keep our strong guys as bodyguards, but we were having problems. So that led us to believe that it was time that we had a place of our own. In that process, it made us stronger and got us unified. This community is the most unified community I've ever known. We are all one people. There was no such things like initially we would say, our ah, Uganda noche, our ah, Kenya noche, our ah, Dar Islam noche, our ah, Masid Maut Onati. None of this exists anymore. We are one. And inshallah, inshallah, we will remain one. I'm going to show you a picture of our Bayview Mosque, which was. Um, uh, given to us in January of 1980, 79 or 80, but I think it's 80. We use this mosque uh, almost every Thursday, Fridays, and every other day and auspicious days. Many times people don't appreciate the centers because it's already there for them. They take it for granted. They do not realize that it is not the communities who build the centers. It is the center which builds the community, actually. It was a new country, a uh, new place. Um, we were all coming from the tropical climate, so there was the challenging in, the, in the, all the different seasons here. The winters were harsh in North America, as you know, in, particularly in Canada and some parts in the US. So it was establishing themselves, finding jobs. Uh, they had to find travel distances where there was a little shop, 
Similarly for, for halal, zabiha, meat. People were concerned about the, the lack of madrasas because it, it affected their children's religious education. Moreover, there were no, there were no alims uh, for our culture community in those days. Uh, we hadn't yet attracted them. And so there was a concern for uh, religious education and, and who would conduct weddings, funerals, uh, majalises, etc., etc. Gradually, we were able to uh, acquire or attract uh, alims and alimas to come from uh, abroad to, to help us. In East Africa, as you may know, uh, we lived close to each other, we studied together, we went to mosque in the same town and we went to the same sports clubs and the same retail shops and so there was always an interaction between our community members. In the West it was much more difficult than that and so initially in those early days loneliness was a, a real factor, loneliness, depression uh, and many of our community members were affected by that. Despite the fact that you had to now find a new way and navigate your way through North American society and establish yourself and, and learn about the society, you had the story of Imam Hussein, you had the Ahlul Bayt, you had our faith to hold on to. Uh, and, and that gave you the right bearing and the right moral compass as you tried to navigate your way through this new and strange society where cultural norms and societal norms were very different to what you were used to in East Africa. And so your faith and your belief in the Ahlul Bayt gave you that strength, if you like, to continue. The generation who came first, whether they came because of the forced expulsion from Uganda or those who came according to their own plan, you know, from Tanzania or, um, you know, Kenya or India and Pakistan, they basically came for having a good life here for themselves and their children. Because they were not raised here, they didn't know what their children are going through in the schools. The pressures, peer pressure, the issue of temptation, challenges as a minority, where Muslims didn't really have much of a voice, you know, the way we have now, alhamdulillah. So the previous generation only thought about Sunday schools. Those who have grown here and became, you know, young parents, it is their generation who became very enthusiastic about having a full-time school. So at least during the early age, our children can have proper education, the best secular education, but with the you know, Islamic uh, perspective within and the, uh, and the environment. The purpose of Nasimco was really to be an umbrella organization or a central body helping the, 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 all the Jamaats of North America come together. It was really to tie it all up as a, have a regional federation to look after these communities because as you said in the early days the hardships was building the Imam Bargas, Husseiniyas, getting the families together, religious education, getting uh, alim for, 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 uh, for the religious propagation so that the community can be together. This is where Nasimco was formed uh, in 1980. Nasimco's achievements has been really this, the basically supporting the, the, the local member Jamaats um, uh, and they have uh, establishing the, the centers, um, the, uh, the madrasas was the, I think the big central contribution that it tied up all the community with, okay? Apart from obviously helping in, 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 in fundraising for the community for different uh, projects. Kodak is, is very united when it comes to issues and when there are uh, challenges uh, within, you know. So that is the strength and if we can build on that strength, uh, Alhamdulillah, um, we have a quite affluent community we have um, uh, business people, okay? Um, so um, community, alhamdulillah, is, is quite resourceful. It is how the, the, the second generations come together will, will really make it uh, uh, for the future.
We're now an established community with uh, uh, Jamaats in many cities and centers that are absolutely buzzing with activity. Um, we have essentially become a part or a part of the social fabric of North America and, and the societies and the communities that we live in. We contribute not only our taxes, but also our skills, our knowledge, our leadership, um, our professional designations, many of us have become professionals, and indeed our entrepreneurs have created jobs for the local communities that they have established themselves in. Despite the many efforts of uh, Koja leaders and, and communities, um, we remain a relatively insulated community. There is more that we can do to create relationships and alliances with other communities. Because if in future um, we get governments or we find ourselves with a government who opposes, for want of a better word, our, our culture, our beliefs, our religious um, traditions, we would be, then be able to stand together with those communities to, to oppose what they are trying to do to us or to, or to, or to fight back, as it were. And a good case in point here is Bill 21 in Quebec, where the Sikh, Jewish and Muslim communities have worked together to oppose this oppressive bill um, and have actually had some success in doing so.